Good morning, everyone. So glad to have you with us. Uh, thank you for praying for Pastor Stephanie as she's away. I can tell you firsthand, uh, no matter how nice a nation is or difficult, there are things that are different obstacles that you face that you just, the prayer makes a massive, massive difference. And Brazil is not Pakistan, but it's still a different culture and, and different time zone and everything else. And so thank you for praying for her. This came up about a month ago, and uh, we believe it is a God thing. We believe we have a connection with Brazil. And I can tell you this, what Pastor Stephanie will be under, which is the glory of God, she will bring back with her. So it'll be, you guys missed a good time to say amen right there. So um, young people, you are dismissed with Dr. Scott. Go get him. God bless you. That is wonderful. And uh, but so thank you for praying. Thank you for believing God with her for just great things. She'll be ministering at a women's conference and uh, doing some other things as well. And uh, so glad to have you. Anyone here for the very first time at all? Okay. How many of you, th how many of you think the Steelers are going to win today? Oh, that was, I tell you, that was not very, and I was about as excited as the Pirates right there. So hopefully we have a good win today. Hallelujah. I'm excited to share with you. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the goodness of God. And Lord, thank you for your people. And Lord, as they work all week and the world drains them and they get empty, may you fill each of us today with hope, and faith, and love, and expectancy. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And most of all, Lord, may we see Jesus like we've never seen him before. In the name of the Lord, amen. I think you know the title of my message today. It is unshakable. Several years ago, the Lord gave me a message that I called undevourable. And with that, the Bible says, Satan goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But if we will stand against him and resist him, thank God we can be undevourable. We submit to God, we resist the devil, and he flees. And then more recently, I did a lesson called unoffendable. Jesus said in the last days, many would be offended. But here's the reality. Many doesn't mean all. An offense is a choice. I've passed up many opportunities to be offended. What about you? So you can be undevourable, and you can even be unoffendable. And we live in a, society, in a society that is offended about everything. But aren't you glad we have the love of God, we can overcome, we can choose to say no to offenses. But also with that, we can be unshakable. We're living in a world where every system and structure seems to be shaking. There's nothing that is totally secure in our lives. I remember several years ago, I was in my office studying, which is what I always do during the week. And as I was there, the whole building began to shake. And I realized we were experiencing an earthquake. And it's the first time in my life I've ever felt that. I knew immediately what it was. Now, none of the books fell off my shelves. Thank God for that. And uh, there was nothing broken or anything of that nature, but it was a very unsettling feeling. Because we're on the second floor upstairs, where do you go to if there's an earthquake? You don't know how it's going to divide or what's going to happen. You don't know where firm footing is. It was not so much scary like I'm going to die, but I thought, where do I go? What do I do when even the ground is not guaranteed. And so for a lot of people, that's the way their life is. Everything seems to be shaking, and they're looking for something where they can be strong and secure. I've got good news for you. You can be unshakable when everything 
around you is shaking. So let's talk about this today from the book of Hebrews in chapter number 12. Hebrews 11 talked about the Faith Hall of Fame. And then we come into chapter 12. And the second half of Hebrews 12 talks about the difference between the old covenant under Moses and the new covenant under Jesus. And in the passage I'm about to read, look for these words, shook, shake, or shaken. Verse 25 of Hebrews 12, See that you do not refuse him, that is Jesus, who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused Moses, who warned them on earth, much less will they escape if they reject him, Jesus, who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he is promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So notice this verse is talking about a shaking. Now, some of that will take place during the end of the tribulation as we move into the millennium. There will be a lot of changes. But how many of you would agree that things are being shaken in the earth right now? But notice the word unshakable. It's found twice in the following verse. This is Hebrews 12, verse 27. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping Him with holy fear and awe. So twice in that passage, we have the word unshakable. Notice also the Bible talks about receiving a kingdom. Now that phrase, the kingdom or the kingdom of God, is found about 60 times in the New Testament. Now, there cannot be a kingdom without a king. Jesus is that king. But what does the Bible talk about when it talks about the kingdom of God? Because it talks about it a lot. Well, two main things. Number one, a physical kingdom. During the millennium, that's a future time period after the tribulation, Jesus will rule and reign on the earth physically, literally, for a thousand years. We don't have to vote every four years. We don't have to wonder if it's going to be a fair vote. He gets voted in by the Father. He reigns in Jerusalem on David's throne for a thousand years. And his is a perfect reign. So there is a kingdom future that is a physical kingdom on the earth. And if you know Jesus Christ, you will be in that kingdom. But there's a second kingdom, and that is a spiritual kingdom. And we're walking in that right now. Believers partake of this kingdom now. This takes place the moment you are born again. Because John 3, 3 says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, the unbeliever is in the world, but they're not in the kingdom. You and I are in the world. We're not of it, but we're in it. But we're actually in the kingdom of God. So the kingdom can refer to the millennial kingdom where Jesus will reign for a thousand years. At that time, he is the king, capital K, of all kings. 
and the Lord, capital L, of all lords. One day, Jesus will be king over all the earth, but Jesus is our king right now. He rules the kingdom we serve in his kingdom. Now, the phrase let us, not lettuce as in salad, but let us is found 13 times in the book of Hebrews. You'll find it all throughout Hebrews. And one of those passages is talked about here. Now, the Lord could have simply given us a command, do this or don't do that. And sometimes he does that in the scripture. But instead, he is giving us a divine invitation to go farther with him. Let us. The Old Testament says, let us reason together. So we're going to take a look at a passage that talks about this. This is one of the 13 let us verses. Verse 28, Hebrews 12. Since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us be filled with gratitude. And so worship God acceptably with his reverence and awe. Most of you know I turned 62 this week. And I think back when I was born, my mom was quite young. Things were very different back in those days. And I was born, I was three and a half pounds when I was born. That's not very big. And I dropped down to three pounds and two ounces. And so I was in a hospital for about five or six weeks as they were taking care of me, not sure how I would do. And it was just the grace of God that I made it through all of that, being so small. And then at 14 years of age, you know that I had anorexia and went from about 135 pounds to about 85 pounds. Carol Nomita said I was the skinniest alive person she had ever seen. And I was instantly healed and delivered of anorexia. I mean, instantly. Because there was a blinder over my eyes, and when the blinder was gone, I thought, bless God, I can eat some more food. I can do things differently. And I've gained 80 pounds since then. That's how skinny I was. And I look at all the times in my life that I had ups and downs and ins and outs, and I can say this. I've seen a lot of shaking in the earth and in my life, but my God has been unshakable. And I believe many of you could say the same. There should be a distinction between the world and the church because the things they valued and put faith and confidence in are no longer as stable as they once were. The Bible says everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So that what cannot be shaken will remain. So people are looking for something that is unshakable. His name is Jesus. And his word is unshakable. And his character is unshakable. So here's the reality. Like father, like son. Like father, like daughter. As you grow in Christ, you can learn to be unshakable. Now, I'm not saying you will not have some battles. I'm not saying you won't have some down times. The Bible says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. How many of you have ever had the shadow of death you've been in? But here's what it says, yea, though I walk through the valley. I'm not saying you'll never have a valley. I'm just saying don't live in the valley. Go through it, Come on out on the other side and say, I will be unshakable. Now, I want to look at another passage today where the Apostle Paul is talking about his ministry. In 2 Corinthians, compared to 1 Corinthians, he's being attacked by some that don't know that he's called as an apostle. They don't recognize that calling. And he is validating his ministry. 
He is validating his call. And he talks about the opposition that he deals with as an apostle, really as a believer. And in verses 8 through 10, I love the Phillips translation. Now, if we are honest, every one of us has had those times where we want to give up, throw in the towel, say, I'm done. Many Christians do it. But I want to give you Paul's mentality, his attitude. I love this. We are hard-pressed on all sides, but we are never frustrated. We are puzzled, but never in despair. We are persecuted, but are never deserted. And here's the portion I love. We may be knocked down, but we are never knocked out. We may be knocked down, but we are never knocked out. Pastor Mark, have you ever wanted to quit the ministry? About a thousand times, usually on Monday mornings. Most preachers are like that. And a couple of times I've been more than tempted, but you know what? I say, I will not leave because of challenge or opposition or hardship. I will leave when God says, your assignment is done. Until that time, I will finish, and I will finish strong, and I will be faithful. The devil is not going to stop my call. God is greater than, and bigger than, and more than, and he is the same in your life too. It is always too early to quit. When I see my brothers and sisters overseas, they, they all call us mom and dad because we're older than all of their parents. They don't live that long. And so they'll say, dad, mom, every day we put our life on the line. We may be killed today. We may be destitute today, but we will be faithful to the call of God. Pastor Stephanie ministered at a brick kiln this last week, and she calls it tea time with Safta. That's her grandma name. So she literally has a teapot and tea, and then they go into a brick kiln where there are slaves there. And the children of those slaves do not get an education unless someone comes and ministers to them. So we have a couple that goes there and ministers to them. And then Pastor Stephanie will be online and, and she'll be doing puppets and doing different things. And the Lord told her to do this. And she's been ministering into that brick kiln into the lives of these precious children. The husband and wife were raised for many years in brick kilns. Five years. They know what it's like. Horrible conditions. Sometimes they're burned physically. Sometimes they're taken advantage of sexually. Very difficult. Now they teach Urdu and English and Jesus to those children. And they said, Dad, Dad we get in a rick, uh, uh, just a motorcycle, a rickshaw with a little cover over it. The conditions are difficult. We go three hours each way, bumpity bump all the way there. We minister all day. We come back. We're exhausted, but we're willing to live or die for Jesus Christ. You know what? If they can fight the good fight, we can fight the good fight as well. Our fight is different. Our fight is through apathy and complacency and lethargy. We say, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to be everything God has called me to be. You are more than enough for every battle and obstacle because of the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Now, the Apostle Paul talks about why he can have a victorious attitude. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13 since we have the same spirit of faith, much of the world operates in the spirit of fear. We are called to operate in the spirit of faith. And here's what it says. Having the same spirit of faith according to what is written. So we have a quote from one, Psalm 116 verse 10. According to what is written in the book of Psalms, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. 
just as a reminder, the two foundations of faith are number one, believing with the heart, and number two, saying with the mouth. Faith works by believing and saying. Now, the believing part is not that difficult. It is the saying part that we sometimes struggle with. But our faith should affect our attitude. It causes us to be positive in a negative world. No matter what you are dealing with, here's what I know. Jesus is coming back for his own. Jesus will give us victory. As Brother Copeland says, I read the back of the book and I know this. In the end, we win. We are overcomers. Now, verse 16 says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Have you found that your outward man is perishing? Every now and again, I see a picture of myself and say, when did I become my dad? Who is that old man? Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, spirit and soul, is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is, but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, some of you are facing some really difficult things right now. And I'm not making light of any of that. But notice how Paul calls this, our light affliction. And how long is it? It is but for a moment. Now, it doesn't seem that way when you're in the midst of it. But compared to eternity, it is light, and it is but for a moment. Because we know this, there's always a beginning, but there's always an end as well. Now, I want to read this from the New Living Translation. This is why we never give up. Say this with me, I will never give up. This is why we never give up, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. That's a good reminder. Our present troubles are small. They may not feel that way, but from heaven's perspective, they're small, and they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly out outweighs them and will last forever. But here's the thing. We need to understand what to do because the Bible says they are present troubles that are small and don't last that long. But when you're in the middle of it, they seem big and they seem like they're never going away. Would you agree with that? So here's what Paul says about that. Let's continue. Verse number 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. How in the world do you look at something that is not seen? Help me out. How do you look at something that is not seen? By the eyes of faith. You see, the unbeliever, notice that phrase, doesn't believe. They're unbelievers. But we are people of faith. The reality is, none of us have ever seen God. Probably never seen Jesus. But we believe Him. Why? Because we're believers. We believe by faith that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. But then it says this, for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal. And here's the problem with what the world deals with. They have no concept of the eternal or the invisible. All they see 
is what they can see with their eyes. What they can see, feel, taste, touch, or smell. Now we acknowledge all of those, but we know there is an eternal world. And we know that that world is, has the final say in our lives. So with our physical eyes, it is impossible to look at things which are not seen. You cannot see the wind. You cannot see the airwaves. So we look at those through the eyes of faith. Now let me explain something. We are not denying reality. Please understand that. Years ago, we had a, a church member who was going to the same Bible school I did, and we were being taught about faith and, and making declarations of faith and so forth, which I believe in. But she had a warped perspective. She was so afraid to make a bad confession that she had a lot of physical issues. And I went down to a conference, and I got to minister to two of our church members who were younger, who were in Bible school. And this one woman was having great physical problems, young lady. But she, I'd say, well, what are you dealing with? And she would not say anything. She was so afraid to make a bad confession, she could not even tell me what she was dealing with. Then she finally went to the doctor, and he said, how can I help you? And she did not say anything lest she make a bad confession. And her friend said, please tell the doctor what's wrong. And he couldn't get it out of her. He wasn't sure what was going on. Listen, you can state the facts and still believe in a higher reality of the truth of God's Word. You can say, I'm dealing with this financial issue or this physical challenge or whatever, but I know the Word of God says He will meet my needs. But we're not denying reality by any means, but we are re recognizing there can be a higher reality. The Bible says faith is the evidence of things not seen. Now, where the Bible says that the things that are seen are temporary, the King James Version says temporal. But I like the word temporary because you and I understand that word today. For example, if you have a temporary job, what does it mean? It's not permanent. It's a temp job. Sometimes you need a job for a little while, so you call a temp agency. You don't call them looking for a long-term career. You need something that can get you in for a season to pay some bills. Why? It is temporary. It is not forever. Many of you know that Jerry Savelle passed away about five or six months ago. And he was one of my heroes. And I remember where I was when I got the text. I was at a Duncan, no, I was at a Tim Hortons coffee shop. I was traveling somewhere, I pulled in to get a cup of coffee, and I got a text from my friend, and I was really, really moved by his passing. Other than Brother Hagen and Buddy Harrison, it really rocked my world. Not in a bad sense, but I was just, he was a hero of mine, a hero of faith and integrity and truth. And so I was just saying, Lord, I don't know how all of this works, but I know there are mantles, and I know there are anointings. I never worked for him personally. I did not know him personally, but I have followed him for 45 years. So if there's anything I can grab from that mantle, however that works, I just receive that. And I felt like the Lord said, for the next six months, feed on his materials. So twice a week or more, every week, I'm just feeding on his materials. Because mantles don't go away. His life call to teach people to win is still necessary and available. So I said, whatever that looks like, I'm not going to teach it like him. It'll be more expository and so forth. But whatever I can receive, I do it. So I've been feeding on him, and it just builds my faith. And he was reading this verse one time, and the Lord began to speak to him. And he said, Lord, what is it? what does it mean to be temporal? That which we see is temporal. And the Lord said this, it is subject to change. Say that with me. Subject to change. You see, the, the enemy tells you that problem will never go away. But if it can be seen with the eyes, it is temporary. And if it is temporary, it is subject to change. 
The enemy brings something before you and says, this will never go away. This Goliath will never fall. You will never get victory. You will never see breakthrough. But if it can be seen with our eyes, it is temporary. And if it is temporary, it is subject to change. Listen to me. Your checkbook balance is temporary. It is subject to change. Your family dynamic is temporary. It is, help me out now, subject to change. Your work situation is temporary. It is subject to change. Your health crisis is temporary. It is subject to change. And your mental state, Lord willing, is temporary. It is subject to change. If you can see it, it is subject to change. Because there is a temporal world, but it is inferior to the eternal world. Now what is our part to play in this? Well, Psalm 15.5 says, speaking about the believer, he shall not be moved. Psalm 62, verse 6, he, speaking about God, only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In other words, we can be unmovable. Now, that's not easy, and I don't always do it, but I love to be reminded of this verse. Acts 20, 24 Paul was about ready to be taken as a prisoner to Rome. Eventually, his life would be ended there. But here's what he said. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. In other words, I'm willing to live or die for the gospel so that I may finish my race with joy. He said, I want to finish strong. But he said, none of these things move me. Now let me explain something. He was not saying that he was unmoved. He was saying, none of these things move me. In other words, the persecution, the opposition, the resistance, those things do not move me. He was moved by the promises of God. He was moved by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He was not moved by all the noise the enemy was bringing. Smith Wigglesworth put it this way, I am not moved by what I see. I am moved only by what I believe. I know this, no man looks at appearances if he believes. No man considers how he feels if he believes. The man who believes God has it already by faith. I am not moved. Now, the word unmoved in the dictionary simply means this. It means not affected by emotion or excitement, not changed in purpose or position. We could put it this way. Because God's kingdom is unshakable, we can be unmovable. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much that you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast and unmovable. I close with this. Our, the Bible says in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, naturally, physically, you are most likely a citizen of the United States. Well, the moment you got born again, you became a citizen of heaven. 
but we live in two worlds. There is the physical world, and there is the spiritual world. And our body contacts this natural physical world, but our inward man contacts the spiritual world where God lives. So I want to remind you of what you have and who you are because you are born again. You are in this natural world, but you are not of it. Have you ever gotten around a lot of unbelievers and you just realize, I don't belong here. This is not my people. I mean, not that I don't care for them, but I don't have the same values, the same passions, the same desires. We are residing in the earth, but we are citizens of heaven. Physically, we're living on the earth, but spiritually, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So this natural, temporal world is always changing. Would you agree with that? Whether it's circumstances, or the economy, or the stock market, or relationships, they are always fluctuating. They are never dependable. And that's why it is so scary for the unbeliever, because they don't know where to place themselves, because nothing is secure. But in the kingdom of God, nothing changes. The Lord says, I am the Lord, I change not. And here's why I love the Bible so much. How important is it? Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, and that will happen one day, but my words will never pass away. Several years ago, there was a famous man in France who hated God and did everything he could to eradicate Christianity. And he said, in a hundred years, Christianity will be wiped off the map. Well, a hundred years later, he died, and where he lived was being used by the Geneva Bible Association to send Bibles to the world. You will not stop God's plan or his work. So I close with this. The situations and circumstances in this natural world are subject to change. But the promises of God are unshakable and unchangeable. Right now, everything that can be shaken will be shaken, so that what cannot be shaken will remain. I know it's a crazy election year, and a lot is going on, but remember this. We believe the gospel. And the word gospel means good news. In the midst of all the bad news, there is good news for those who serve the Lord. As we stand upon God's word, we can be unshakable. There should be a distinction between the world and the church. What's the key? Get your eyes beyond the circumstances. Don't deny them. Recognize them. To say, Lord, that's temporal. It is subject to change. I keep my eyes by faith on you. Your promises never change. They are yes and amen. So no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're going through, from God's perspective, it is light. It is momentary. Do not give up. Keep fighting the good fight of faith, and you will be unshakable. Amen and amen. I've never shared that before just like that. That was hot off the press this week, so I hope that was a blessing to you. When we share it on Facebook, 
do me a favor, reshare it, let others know, because I think sometimes we think, oh, everyone will hear that, but they don't. And so it's a message each of us needs to hear and know. Could you stand for just a moment? Lord, we lift up our hands and our hearts. And Lord, whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're going through, we keep our eyes beyond that onto you. And we determine in our hearts today, we will be unshakable. We may have moments that we flounder, but we dust ourselves off, we get back in the right race, and we don't quit until we win. So, Father, I speak hope to every heart. I speak encouragement to every believer. And, Father, teach us how to walk in that spirit of faith, recognizing that what we see is temporary, but what we do not see, your word, your reality, your promises are eternal. And we make the decision within our hearts, I will be unshakable. Say that with me. I will be unshakable in Jesus' name. Just give the Lord a, a wave offering. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you never change. And Father, like father, like son, like father, like daughter, we want to be like Jesus. We honor you and we love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.